It is a privilege to be with you this evening. I want to begin with a story. Bob, uh, <clears throat> Dr. Glenn, Bob was mentioning a little bit about uh, those early years in the Philippines. I remember as a student, I had finished my MDiv degree and was uh, teaching and ministering in the Philippines. <coughs> was uh, felt the, the Lord calling me to pursue further studies. I didn't know exactly what direction that would go. And I remember at the top of my list was to go to the University of Aberdeen and study with a man by the name of Ihard Marshall. He was a uh, uh, and really focused on uh, Luke Acts, the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts. I felt strongly that this was, you know, this was just a great place to go. So I applied there, I wrote uh, Professor Marshall a letter. He wrote back and he said, you know, I've got a lot of students right now. He said, this year is probably not the time to come. He said, maybe a year later down the road. And so I was wrestling with what school to go to. I remember I had done my MDiv degree at Fuller Seminary and was uh, accepted there and wrestling about going back. But I, I set aside a week of prayer in the mountains in the Philippines to pray about the future. Traveled up and into those mountains and, uh, and then I, I came back after a week up in the mountains praying about the decision and, and where we should go. Hey, there's room. Okay, come on in. Come on in. Uh, uh, praying, praying about what to do and where to go. And I still remember when I returned back into Manila of the Philippines, met my wife at our house. The first thing she said to me when I walked in the door, she said, guess who called? Now this is the Philippines. This is in the 80s. And she said, guess who called on the telephone? And I said, who? And she said, Professor Marshall called. And he said, come immediately. Come now. Which, which would fit our, our time schedule. And so I tell you, well, there was some hooping and hollering in our house that evening. Let me tell you. And I remember I called uh, Professor Marshall the next day. And uh, he has a, a, a strong uh, Scottish-British accent. And over the phone, I, I really did not understand it was probably about 50% of what he said. But I do remember this. He said, you know that you'll need to have a financial guarantee, a letter of fi uh, guarantee of finances. And I had such a strong sense that God was opening the door and calling. I said, that will not be a problem. But when I said that, I had, I had absolutely no idea how we were going to pay for this. We, we had to borrow money to get back home from the Philippines to the United States. Now, you have to think about that when the church gives you a one-way ticket and sends you out. You, you, you wonder what kind of message is that sending. But it was in that context that uh, uh, Bob Lahan encouraged the, the uh, missions department to move forward with the faculty development program. And my wife and I were part of that. Once his mom, once his Julie mom, and good friends. And so I, I thank the Lord for, uh, for uh, Bob and Murray and, and others here. And, uh, and just the opportunity to be with you. I have been encouraged today because the, there's, it's just, uh, uh, there's a lot happening on this campus. Can you say amen to that? And I am excited to see, I am hoping that some of you will be with us in, in China, in Southwest China. And we'll see it's May of 2015. And I believe that can be the beginning of just a cycle of students coming to China. Are you, are you up for that? Are you, are you willing to go where God will call you? Are you willing to, to, to ask, Lord, send me? Amen. Let it be. Let it be. Bless them to the Lord in prayer this evening. Lord, I rejoice. I rejoice in what you are doing at this great institution. And Lord, I think of the lives of the students. Lord, I think of the students here. And Lord, as I, as I think of the future and how you desire to use them, Lord, we just ask that you would, through your Holy Spirit, empower us. Lord, we ask that our stories would merge with those stories that we read in Acts. Lord, we pray that you would give us the same heart, that we would be filled with the same desire and the same passion, that to see people who have never heard, that people groups with no church, to, uh, that, that, that you would enable us to take the gospel and establish your name and lift up your name in these places. Lord, we acknowledge that we desperately need 
your strength. We desperately need your guidance. We desperately need the power of your Holy Spirit at work in our lives. Lord, I pray that this evening that you would speak to us and just continue to develop a hunger in our lives. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. It was just two months ago that I had the joy to participate in the Ascendance of God Centennial celebrations that were held in Springfield, Missouri. It could be that some of you had an opportunity to participate in that. Was anybody there in Springfield at that Centennial celebration? Okay, yes. Okay. It was an amazing, uh, an amazing event. And I remember <clears throat> before the, the celebration began, it took place on Thursday, that the couple days before that celebration began, there was a global church planting uh, summit that was conducted at my home church uh, in Springfield, Missouri <coughs> Central Assembly. And I remember on Wednesday evening, I had the opportunity to be a part of one of these uh, meetings that was conducted at Central Assembly. I still remember that. This is my home church. I was familiar with the church. I arrived at the church about a half an hour early, and I, I realized that I was already too late. No parking to be had. The church normally would see well over 2,000 people. It was, it was packed with people. That they, I believe that there were over 3,000 people uh, that were present at that meeting. They had, uh, you know, uh, overflow rooms where they were using closed circuit television. But it was uh, my my opportunity to be together with this large group of, of global Christians. And so I didn't want to be in one of these overflow rooms. So, so I went I went into the main sanctuary, and uh, I I knew that the the lower section was filled. But I went up into the balcony. And there in the balcony, there were no seats, but, but I found in the, just the farthest spot, the farthest spot away from the platform, in the aisle, uh, there was a, a young man from Bangladesh, and he was standing to get a good idea. And I, I realized that we could sit in the aisle, it was the farthest away, and, uh, and that we could uh, participate in the service. And so it was there that I had a chance to worship with other Christians. I think about this. The man next to me was from Bangladesh, a young man. The woman to my left was from Venezuela. There was an African brother who at various points was in the aisle worshiping with us as well. It was, and this, this is just a, a microcosm, a picture of the, the global impact of the Pentecostal movement and the Assemblies of God. And it was a, a wonderful experience to see that. And as I was worshiping together, here in 2014, with this, this group from all over the world, 120 different nations represented. In fact, George Wood made a comment. He said, hey, at Pentecost, weren't there 120 uh, disciples? 120 nations. He, he made that parallel. But as we were there, worshiping, I couldn't help but think back to 100 years earlier. You see, it was in uh, November of 1914 that in Chicago, at that historic Stone Church, that there was a gathering, a group of over 500 pastors and delegates from the Assemblies of God churches. It was the second General Council of the Assemblies of God. Now, I want you to think about that. The first General Council was held earlier in 1914. And so they had a second General Council uh, held a few months later in November. And I think that tells us that uh, there were some questions, there were some issues that they had to hammer out. And yet those 500 people, they gathered together in that stone church. And it was there that they committed themselves to the greatest evangelism the world has ever seen. I want you to think about that. These were not the rich and the powerful. These were not the famous. These were not the well-heeled. These were not largely the educated. But there were 500 people that they had a vision. They had a sense of call. They had a sense of connection to the apostolic church. And they said, we will commit ourselves to the greatest evangelism the world has ever seen. And then, remarkably, with the help of the Holy Spirit, they went out and did it. They went out and did it. They were the vanguard. Now, I'm not saying it was just the assemblies of God. But they were the vanguard of a of a group of missionaries that uh, had that, that established the most uh, successful 
uh, the, the most successful evangelism the world has ever seen. In fact, Philip Jenkins, a sociologist uh, from Penn State, he makes the statement, he says, the Pentecostal movement of the 20th century, the, the Pentecostal movement has to be considered has to be considered the most successful social movement of any kind in the 20th century. Political, religious, you know, the most successful social movement of any kind. In 1900, <coughs> how many Pentecostals were there? Zero. 1900. Today, how many Pentecostals are there? Depends on how broadly the definitions are used. Many would say there are 600 million Pentecostals around the world. If we look at denominational Pentecostals, classical Pentecostals, the number would still be over, well over 200 million. Now think about that. The zero in a century to 200 million or 600 million. No wonder Philip Jenkins can say this is the most successful social movement of the 20th century. As we reflect on this history, a rich history, I want to suggest to you that this history, that this Praxis, that this missions activity is directly connected to a strong theology. A theology that I pray that we do not lose. Convictions that shape this movement. And my plea this evening is to say this, that these are convictions that, that, uh, that we want to hold on to, that we want to retain. These are convictions that sh should shape our lives and our mission. Well, what are these convictions? How many of you were here at the 3 o'clock uh, session? A pretty, a pretty good number. 